subject, which is types. And I'm going to talk a little bit about types in the context of the Haskell programming language. So I do a lot of my work in thinking about Haskell's type system. So before I really get started with my talk, I want to find out how, how many people in this room have used Haskell before. Right. OK. Oh, wow. <laughs> great, great. So I can go a little bit faster through some of those explanations. OK, so I want to talk about um, Haskell. And I really want to talk about TDD, right? So I want to talk about type-driven development, where we use types to actually help us figure out what code we want to write. And if you work in a language with an expressive type system, you know what I mean, right? You know where just writing the type down can give you an idea of what code that you want to write. And I want to go a little bit further and do it with dependent types, where that's kind of like off the end of the chart of expressiveness when it comes to type systems. And so the inspiration for this is it comes from like a, a mailing list post from a while back of somebody who had been using the Agda programming language. So Agda is a dependently typed programming language. And so in that language, you can use the type system to express invariants. And um, Jonathan had talked a little bit about his experience in Agda, where he used the dependent types in Agda to talk about invariants in a red-black tree. So if, you, if you've programmed a red-black tree before, it's a balanced binary tree data structure where you have invariants about red nodes and black nodes. The red nodes can have black children. Black nodes can have any kind of children. You have invariants about how the black heights along every path. And these invariants guarantee that the tree stays balanced. And so he had written those invariants in the type of his red-black tree. And then he implemented the red-black tree all of the operations so that they satisfied those invariants, so that they type checked. And he really found that as, as, as directing his development process. So that's the kind of idea I want to capture. But I, I don't want to do it in, in, in Agda, right? I want to do it in Haskell, right? Because I, I do a lot of my programming in Haskell. So what can we do? How can we use Haskell's type system to help guide us capture these domain-specific invariants of our data structures or our applications and help us develop our code, right? And so I want to say today that, yeah, Haskell, just like Agda, there's a way you can view Haskell as a dependently typed language. Um, so yes, with maybe some caveats. Um, OK, so today, so I'm really going to focus in on some particular type system extensions in Haskell and kind of show you through example why I f believe that those make Haskell a dependently typed language and kind of talk a little bit about where they came from and also talk about you know, where we're going to go, right? how we can extend Haskell so that it's even more like a dependently typed language like Agda or if you've used Idris or if you've used Cock. These are dependently typed languages where you can do just about everything in the type system. How far, how close is Haskell to that situation? And I'm going to use, I'm going to use the same example from that, from that uh, mailing list. I'm going to use red black trees, right? And so here's the invariance of the red black tree, right? So it's just a binary tree where every node in the tree has a color. And in these invariants, as long as these invariants hold, then we're going to call it a red-black tree, right? So the, the very top node of the tree has to be black. All of the nodes at the bottom are black. And if you have a red node, they, they're going to be in the middle. They have to have black children. And as you go through from, from the root to all of the leaves, you have to have the same black height everywhere. Right. You may have different numbers of red nodes, so it's not fully constraining. But the fact that you have the same black height everywhere is going to guarantee that this tree is balanced. And so what I want to do is show you how we can capture these invariants using Haskell's type system. And if you want to follow along or if you want to look up the code afterwards, all of these examples are on my GitHub um, DTH for dependently typed Haskell. OK. so. Um, 
let's just start off by encoding red black trees in Haskell without the without maintaining the invariant. So this is following this is comes from a really great paper by Chris Okasaki who described just showed how beautiful red black trees are when you implement them with Haskell pattern matching. Okay. Here we have red black trees in Haskell. Um, we have red and black colors. And when we cr create our tree data type, I'm just going to be kind of vague about what type of data is stored in the tree. Right? It's some ordered data. It has to have an order constraint. But um, we have some data in the tree. We have a left child. We have a right child. And we also have a color at all of our nodes. Right? And when we insert into this tree, right, it's, a, it's a binary search tree. We're going to insert into this tree. We need, to, uh, we need to make a new node in the tree for a new value. So we get our old tree. We get that value. And we're going to insert into it with this helper function called INS. And this insertion function, if the tree is empty, we just make a red node to contain our new value. If the tree is not empty, we're going to compare the value that we're inserting with the value at that node. And either, either it's already there, or we're going to need to insert on the left or on the right. So this is just insertion in a binary search tree. This isn't insertion in a red-black tree, because this the code that I'm showing you is going to violate the red-black tree invariance. Right? And so the, what's important in this implementation is that we're going to violate the invariance, but then we're going to recover them. So we need to do two things. There's two ways we could inviolate those invariants when we use this insertion function. Right? It could be that maybe we have an empty tree, and we are creating this red node. Well, that's a tree that's red at the root. Right? And then there are other ways we could have trees that are red at the root. And so to fix that up, we have a helper function here that's going to take whatever is at, whatever is at the root after we've done the insertion, whatever's there, it's going to make sure, just going to force it to be black. Right? So that's, that's, that's guaranteed to have black at the root. The other problem we could have is that we could, when we do this insertion, we're always making red nodes in the insertion. We could end up with two red nodes in a row. And remember, red nodes have to have black children. And so to fix that, we have, we have a balance operation. And so that's kind of the trick. That's where we're going to ensure that the tree is balanced. We're going to reorder the nodes. And I'm just going to show you. I'm not going to write the code for that. I'm going to show you how it looks pictorially. So balance, if it's not one of these four trees, it's just going to leave it alone. But these are the four trees that it's going to reshuffle, right? So each of these, this is where you have a black on top and then two reds right underneath. If it was just two reds on top, we wouldn't need to be balanced because the blacken would take care of it, right? But if we go and then end up with a black on top, right, then we're in trouble. And we're only going to have one violation, because we only did one insertion. So these gray triangles are just any other arbitrary tree. And so if we, there's four different ways we could get into trouble. But we're going to fix all four of those ways in the same way, by just rearranging these four trees into this tree, which preserves our invariant. Right? It has, it has a red node with black below it. That was, that was our problem before. We had a red node with a red child. And it has the same black height that we had before, so we're not really changing how the black height works. And if it turns out that this would be the top, we can blacken it, and that would also satisfy the invariant. Right? So those two things, by blackening the top node and rebalancing the tree to make sure that if we have two reds in a row, we can shift it so that they're not in a row anymore. It, that's the key idea that's going to make this a valid red-black tree, black tree implementation. Right? And so how do we know? Well, like I, I, I argued to you pretty informally that this is satisfying the red-black tree invariance. Do you believe me? How do we know, right? Um, we could ask the Haskell type checker to verify it for us, right? right? And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new type that is going to verify that when we, the tree that we produce satisfies those invariants. So I'm going to define a type called RBT for red black tree. And that red black tree, it's not going to hold arbitrary trees. It's only going to hold trees that, satisfies that satisfy that red black tree invariant. Okay, so let's talk about how we could define that type, 
right? And then we know from the insertion function, if you were given a tree that is a red-black tree, you add something to it, your result, if, if it type checks with this type, you know it will be a red-black tree. You don't know that it contains the element that you actually put the thing in, but you know you at least will have a red-black tree. Okay, so how would we do it? Now let's go look at how Agda would do it, right? Because Agda can, is really good at expressing invariants like this. And so this is, um, this is an implementation that I got from Dan Licata that explains, so in Agda, this tree data type captures some of the invariants of the red-black tree. How does it do it? Well, it's using these two standard data types. Right, so these are just normal data types like Haskell ones that for natural numbers, zero and successor, and for colors, just like we had before. But we're going to use those data types down here in our definition of the tree. The tree is not just a regular data type, it's an index data type where the type takes two additional parameters, and those parameters are going to talk about the invariants. Right, so if you look and see, um, um, we, have, we actually have three different constructors for this data type now, right? So before we just had E and T, now we have the empty trees. Their color is black, right? So you can see how the type is telling you what color is at the top of the tree. And we've split the T data constructor that constructs, constructs a node in the tree for if we have a red node at the top or if we have a black node at the top. And so the type is, again, telling us that we have a red node or a black node. And that helps us capture the constraint that a red node has to have black children, right? So here, the, the, the TR constructor requires uh, black trees on the right and left. If you try to give it a red tree, have a red tree on top of a red tree, you're going to get a type error if you try to do it that way. Um, the, other, the other index here, the natural number, that's tracking the black height. Right, so that's a number that's counting how many black nodes we've seen. Right, so the empty tree, there are no black nodes in it, so the number is zero. Um, over here, for a red node, well, the two sides have to have the same black height, so they're both in. But the red node is not a black node, so we don't add anything to it. We're just going to preserve the same black height. By added, putting a red node on top of two other trees, we're not incrementing the black height. But when we have a black node, Right, we have to we have to make the black height one larger than the black heights of the trees below. Right, so we're capturing these ideas. These are the invariants that we just talked about that make a red black tree. Well, now we're getting the type system to, to enforce them. Right, and we're really using dependent types here. Right, because here we have these types, and these types they depend on earlier parameters to the data constructor. Right, so the type of this argument, it, it mentions C1 and N, and those are earlier parameters to the TB data constructor. Right, the, that is kind of where the name dependent types comes from. Now, the other thing to note about Agda is that we have these curly braces. There's not really a distinction in Agda between types and terms and type arguments and term arguments. They're just arguments, and types are things that you use as types. So what curly braces means, those are, th those are arguments that Agda should try to infer, like implicit parameters uh, that the type checker is going to fill in automatically for you. OK, so this is, the, this is the key data type that we saw that we can do it in Agda. Can we do this in Haskell? Right? And the answer is we can. Right? So here's how it would look like in Haskell. And here I'm using two features from Haskell to directly copy that data type over. Right? So um, just like Agda can have index data types, Haskell can also have types that, um, that have parameters where the, the, um, the, um, the constructors can vary in what those arguments are. Right, and so that's called a, a GADIT, Generalized Algebraic Data Type. It's just a way that Haskell allows you to index types by parameters. Then the other thing is, um, we're doing, where does this color and the NAT come from? So when Haskell has this phase distinction, right, there's a difference between types and expressions and values in Haskell. You can't just stick 
arbitrary values and types, right? So um, what is this B here? And what is this zero? Right? They're, not, they're not normal Haskell values. What's going on here is something that's called data type promotion. We've taken a data type definition from the term language, and we've allowed it to be also available in the type language. Right, so that means in the type language itself, there's a new thing called uh, B and R. Those are two new types, and they have a kind. So kinds are the types of types in Haskell. The, they have a kind that's called color. Right, we've enriched the type language with new structures. We can't write arbitrary programs here. We still have to work with the language of the type language, but we have data types available to us via this promotion mechanism, right? And so that's why, right, so just the same arguments that I had about why the Agda code captures those invariants, they carry straight through to the Haskell version, right? Um, I don't have to put the types in curly braces because Haskell automatically generalizes any type variables in a type. Okay, and you can see, you can try it out. So here this is, like here we're trying it out in GHCI. This is the interactive top level for Haskell. And I can create this tree, so I draw it pictorially. It's a node with two empties underneath, some value, right? I can create it, and then I can ask Haskell, well, what type is this tree, right? And Haskell will tell me, okay, that's a, it's a tree with red at the top with black height zero, right? And the type inference can figure that out. Right, and then if I try to make this tree, right, by taking this one over here and adding a, a black node on top of it, I can ask Haskell, okay, what's the type of this tree? And now this time it's a black tree where the black height is now one. Now in here if I try to do something bad, if I try to do something that violates our invariant, right, I have two red nodes in a row, um, then I get an error message. And the error message is kind of actually, it kind of tells you what, um, what went wrong, right? It said um, when you were constructing this, this um, tree, I needed to see a, a, a child that was black, but you gave me a child that was red, right? And so red and black are not the same, and so I have to reject your program, right? So it's exactly pinpointing where we had that invariant violation. Okay, so we want to capture the fact that the top level, the root of the tree has to be black in a red black tree, right? And remember that type for insert. I said we're going we're gonna to start with a type RBT, insert something into it, and get a type RBT. And that's what this type is here, right? So in Agda, we might say that the, the root is black. We just have this top level kind of wrapper, right? It just holds one of these trees, but it forces the tree to be black. And so that's what it means to be an RBT. You have a tree that has black at the top. We can do the same. They look exactly the same in Haskell and in Agda. And then the insertion function, it's going to start off the same way. It's going to pattern match on that root, and then it's going to call some helper function, function like INS that we saw before to actually insert into that tree. Right? Now, what's going on here? Like these, this code, it looks really similar. How is it different between these two versions, right? Is it really doing the same thing? So I want to, at this point, I want to stop and kind of make some observations about the differences, right? So the first thing is that I mentioned that Agda doesn't have a distinction between types and terms. There are just these things. Uh, some it's a code is a type if you use it like a type, right? There's no pre-built-in syntactic difference. There's no semantic difference. Um, Haskell, on the other hand, does distinguish terms and types. So what does that mean, right? So that means that in, there, in some ways, because we have a distinction between types and terms in Haskell, Haskell is treating types differently than it is treating normal expressions, normal programs, right? So one difference is that it's always going to infer types. So how Haskell's type inference works, if you have a type parameter to a function, a polymorphic function, Haskell's going to infer what that needs to be. Another thing, and it's never going to infer a term parameter. Another thing is that when you have one of these index types, we can't index them by arbitrary computation. We can only index them, index the, the, the data types with types. And then the last difference is that we have this erasure, right? Haskell, the types are there for compile time only. We erase them all before we actually run the program. 
And this is different from AGNA in that when you, since AGNA doesn't distinguish types and terms, it doesn't erase anything. Right, so we have type arguments around for type checking in AGDA, but they stay around as we run the program. Right. Now here, so data type promotion was our key for, it kind of makes it so that the fact that we only have type indices in Haskell makes it really look like the AGDA code. So that's, that's not such so substantive of a difference, right. Erasure, on the other hand, means that there are certain things in our active code that we can do that we can't do it in our Haskell code. So here's an example. So again, remember, this is our top level type that um, that's, says, okay, here's our tree. It forces it to be black. Now what if I wrote a function bh for black height that says, okay, go to a red black tree and tell me it's black height. In Agda, that black height is stored Right, it is a parameter to the root data constructor, so it's stored there, so you can access it and return it. But in Haskell, that parameter, this root data constructor, it's a type parameter, so it's erased. It's not part of the data structure at runtime. So if we tried to somehow extract it, there was no, there's no way. It's not there by the time we're running our code. Okay, so. That's how we represent data and capture those invariants. How do we work with it? Right? Can we actually write this balance function so that we can write our insertion that we know it's going to preserve these invariants? What's, 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 what's difficult is, remember, in the balance function, we're working with things that, aren't, that don't type check anymore. Right? So what's the type of that tree? Right? We just defined a type that rules that tree out. How are we going to be able to rebalance it? Right? And so here I want to talk a little bit about what really comes down to is we need to define some new types for our balance function that are going to talk about exactly in the precise way we are breaking the invariant so that we can see in the result how that invariant can get preserved. And so I'm going to kind of re, I'm going to change how our balance function works a little bit to make it easier for us to define the types that capture what's going on, right? So the first, the first refactoring I'm going to do is I'm actually going to split balance into two cases, right? So if you look, there's kind of, there were four cases that we needed to rebalance. Two were cases where the invariant violation was on the left child. And two were cases where the invariant violation was on the right child. And so I'm actually going to define two different functions, balance left and balance right, that are going to work. Balance left is going to do these two cases. Balance right is going to do those two cases. And this actually makes a lot of sense, because if you remember way back at insertion, we know where the invariant violation is going to be, because we know where we did the insertion on the child, on the, we knew whether we had to insert onto the left or I knew insert on the right, so we don't need to check again, right? We can just call balance left or balance right, depending on where we did insertion. Okay, so, so our balance left function is going to take something that looks like that and turn it into something that looks like that. And how do we, we need a type for things that look like that, and so I'm going to break that guy apart a little bit, right? So we know the argument it's going to be a black, it's going to be a node on top and a violation on the left and just another tree on the right. So I can turn that into, let's just make, make balance left take three arguments, right? Now, now our tree that has a violation is a little bit smaller, so it's going to be a little bit easier for us to describe that violation. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to specialize it again and say, well, OK, we're going to have a special case when the top node is black and the top node is red, because we only need to do this in the case. We only have a violation when the, the, when the root is black. Because if it was red and there's only at most one red, we were going to leave those alone. So here's, here's essentially what our, so I've kind of decomposed the problem into the simpler problem of we have this function balance LB, we need to give it a type, right? It's going to take a tree, it's going to take 
a value, which I'm not drawing. It's going to take the right tree. And it needs to, depending on whether that first tree is this one, that one, or OK, it needs to put things back together in the right way. Right? And now this is, this is the function that we need to give a type to. How do we describe the type of this function? Right? How can we say what's going on? Right? There's not so much uniformity with the result or the input, but we can still say what's going on. So let's look at the result type. Right? So the result type, we're always getting a valid binary search tree, but we don't know what color it's going to be. So if you remember our tree type, it always had to say, this is a binary search tree and the top, and the top node is red or the top node is black. But we can't say, we don't know for this function whether we're going to get a red tree or a black tree in the end. Right? So we're going to make a type that is a, it's a good tree, it's valid, we just don't know what the color is. And I'm going to call that type hidden tree because it's hiding the color of the tree. And then on the other hand, for the input, right, we have two potential inputs that could violate our invariant, but only at the top. Right? So I'm going to call that type almost tree. And that's going to allow us to have exactly one violation right at the top, right? Either we're going to have red, red on the left or red, red on the right. Everywhere else in the tree is going to be a valid tree, right? And again, we don't know what color it's going to be. So let's look and see how we can um, create those two types, right? So we, had, so we had hidden tree for the output, and we had almost tree for the input. How can we create those two types? Right, so again, going and looking at how Agda does it, right, so hidden tree, well, we would just define a, a data constructor that says, okay, it's either a red tree or a black tree, and I'm not going to tell you which one it is in the type, in the result type of hidden tree, right? I, mean, I still will have a red tree or a black tree. I don't have a case for an empty tree. Notice there's, we're leaving out the empty tree because we know after we do an insertion, we don't have an empty tree anymore, and we're rebalancing there. So we don't have a case for empty trees, but we do have a case for red trees and black trees. So we can define that in Agda, right? And um, also for almost tree, right, here's how I might define almost tree. This is a tree that may break this invariant in the root, right? And so um, here, almost tree, what does it look like? So here. Again, I know it's not going to be empty, so it's going to be some node, which has a left child and a right child. But this time, I'm not having any relationship between the color on the left and the color on the right and the color that is at this node, right? So it can be any color, including red. The left tree could be red. The right tree could be red. And then the black height, how do we explain what the black height? We still have to track that black height. Right? I don't know what color the left and right are. I know they have the same black height. The black height of this tree depends on the color at this node. And since it depends on the color of the node, I just write a little function that increments it if the, if the color is black and doesn't increment it if it's red. Right? So I have a little extra function to calculate what the black height is. And here I'm really I'm using a function to describe how that type works. OK, now what, with those two types, in Agda, I can write my balance function, right? So I have, so here are the two cases where I have the red, red environment. So here's an almost tree with a red on the left. Here's an almost tree with a red on the right. I use pattern matching to kind of identify all the different parts of the tree. And then I can just put them all back together as hidden trees in using the, the normal um, TR and TB constructors, putting it back together in the right color tree. And the type checker is making sure that the result actually is a hidden tree. Actually is a red-black tree, I just don't know what color it is. Now there's a few more cases. So these are the cases when I had to rebalance. I also have to write some cases when I don't have to rebalance. And the type checker has to make sure that I didn't have to rebalance. 
So I have to take the tree apart, make sure everything is good, and put it right back together. And again, the type checker does that, right? Right. So these are just all the other cases, um, talking about if, the, if it's black and not one of those, if it's red and different kinds of red trees, and it puts them back together. What about in Haskell? Can we do this in Haskell too? Now, hidden tree looks exactly the same. There was nothing really special going on in hidden tree. Right? We can just write that directly. But what about almost tree? Because you remember we had that function in almost tree to calculate that black height. Well, we can do that in Haskell using something that's called a type family. This is a way of defining a function at the type language that calculates types from other types. And so here, I'm defining this type family. It's called capital anchor, right? It has no relationship to any function I write in the term language. And it takes two arguments, right? It takes a color, which is a promoted data type, and it takes a number, which is a promoted, which is also a promoted data type. And um, it returns a nat, right? So if it's red, we just return the same number. If it's black, we're going to increment that number. Now, with this type family definition, that's what I need to be able to write the result type of almost tree, to talk about how the, or how the black height depends on the color. But where do I get the color from? There's another trick I need to do here, right? So the other thing is, since we have this distinction between types and terms, we don't want the color to be only in the type language. We don't want it to be erased, because we need that when we do the balance function. When we do the balance function, we need to know what kind of tree we have, what color that node is. And so to make sure that we have something around, we're going to use this trick called a singleton type. So that's what's going on in the middle of the slide. Right? We have this definition for the singleton type, which is creating an exact copy of the color that, that's our type level argument in the term language, right? So um, if we have a singleton R, we know there's only one constructor that could be it, the, a term level constructor called SR. And if we have singleton B, there's only one term level constructor that it could produce it, that's SB. And that's how we're going to work around the fact that we have this type term distinction in Haskell, right? And so with that, so here, um, we're, we're faking this dependency, right? So we have the dependency on the color. The color C, that's a type level argument, but we're also maintaining around a term level witness of that color, right? So that's the type family and the singleton type working together so that we can capture this agda invariant in Haskell. Right? And so here was a, this is the code I showed you before that rebalances in agda. Here, I will show you the Haskell version. And once, again, once you define the types, the structure is, it just kind of falls right out. Anything else is just not going to type check. And the difference between the Haskell version and the Agda version, right, so the, the types are pretty much the same. The only difference is we have to use these singletons here when we're rebalancing, right? We can't use the colors directly. That's the only difference between the two versions of the code. Right, so this code, right, the Haskell version, they're kind of in lockstep. There's a lot of similarities between what's going on in the two different languages, right? right? But are they, are they really the same? Do we get this exact same thing about the Haskell code that we get from the Agda code, right? And it's not quite the same. So we have the same type, right? It looks like the same type for insert in Agda that we have in Haskell, right? They both take something that must be a red black tree and they do an insertion and they produce something that must be a red black tree. But the Agda type checker does one thing that the Haskell type checker doesn't do, right? The Agda type checker um, also proves that insertion is a total function, right? It's, it, it includes a totality check so that it says that if you give it these arguments, you absolutely you must get these, this result back. You will get a valid red black tree. Whereas in Haskell, we don't have a totality checker in Haskell when we type check. In Haskell, you preserve the types, but it could be that a Haskell function could go into an infinite loop, for example. It doesn't necessarily have to give back a red black tree. If it happens to give back a red black tree, 
you know, or if having this back anything, you know it will be a red-black tree because of the types. So it's a weaker verification that's going on. But it's also quite convenient to be able to not prove things terminating. Right, so Agatha requires, in fact, Agatha requires everything to be proven total. It, everything has to terminate in Agatha, but that's not the case in Haskell, right? So we get stronger guarantees, but we have to get stronger guarantees, right? And sometimes, um, sometimes not proving as strong a property is a little bit easier to do. And so I want to kind of point out a little bit about how the fact that in Haskell that we don't have to prove everything, we don't have to prove that this function is total, that can actually simplify our lives. All right, so, um, so I've actually done a couple different versions of red-black trees in Haskell. Um, all right, so we saw at the beginning proving nothing other than just simple type checking. Okay, Chris Kosahi's original version, that was about 12 lines of code with defining the types for the colors and the trees, writing the insertion function, writing the balance function, and the blacken function. It's about 12 lines, right? Um, taking the Agda version, I was able to just, just transliterate it over from Agda. That was about 49 lines of code. It's longer because, mostly because I had to define those helper functions, right? The, the almost tree and the hidden tree. And I had to break things apart a little bit more. I had to refactor balance into, into pieces to be able to, to simplify it enough to describe it with those types. Right, so it, it, it was a little bit longer. But on the other hand, I, that's not the only version I've written in Haskell, right? So this captures exactly the reasoning that's going on in the Agda, and it's structured so that Agda can see that it's terminating. But if we don't have to prove the termination, sometimes it can be a little bit easier. So I have another version that I just kind of wrote from scratch from Haskell without following the Agda version. In this version, there's not enough information going on to show that termination. I tried to port it back to the Agda to see if that would work, but Agda, the totality checker, would not be, was not happy. It, would, it just couldn't see why certain things couldn't happen. Right? And that version was, a, that was simpler. I was able to reduce it down to 32 lines of code. Right? And, and, I, and, and I did that, um, I was able to simplify it by just being less precise about things. Right? I, I, for example, balance, I, I didn't say that, um, I didn't, hidden tree is, it must be a valid red back tree. We just don't know the color at the top. If we're a little bit less precise and we say, well, okay, it's almost a tree that you get. It's, it's may be a little bit bigger. That's enough to be able to finish verifying things, but not enough for the totality part. Okay, so what have we seen, right? So what I've kind of walked through this long example of verifying red black trees in Haskell. So it's, it's this real domain specific invariant that we can use. What did we use to be able to, um, to, be able to capture that invariant in Haskell, right? Um, so I would say that there's like two key features that's going on, right? So the first one, so to really make it a dependently typed language, the first one is the fact that we have these index data types. And those index data types give us something that's like flow sensitive type checking. So what does that mean? That means when you have, the, when you have something that's a member of the index data type, you do a pattern match on it. Because of the way the, the type of the data constructors are defined, you find out information from the types. The type system finds out information from that pattern match. For example, you're, you're pattern matching, you pattern match on a singleton B constructor. You know that this color in the type language, you didn't know what color it was, but now you know it must be black in that branch of the pattern match. Right? So the pattern matching takes run information that you learn at runtime and reflects that into the branches of your pattern matches. Right? And so that's a really powerful idea, and that's what's going on behind the singleton type encoding of dependent types that we have here. Right? Because we can do that, we can use the, the singleton trick and much more beside to encode dependently type programming in Haskell. And the, the second thing that we need for dependently type programming is to be able to describe those invariants in the first place. Right? And so for that point of view, we need to have just this very rich language in our type system to describe invariants, 
to say what's going on. So you saw that it was really useful to be able to have data types around to talk about, to, to use them as indices, to use them as arguments, right? So having data structures in your type language, having functions in your type language, right? We implemented the inker function so that we could talk about how the black height changed in the types themselves. Right. The more that we can do that, the more the richer invariants we can specify. I didn't talk about these two, but these are available in Haskell now. Um, you can also put in um, not just data types, but other kinds of data in your types, like numbers and symbols or strings, and use a constraint solver to kind of reason about. Like if you have arithmetic, arithmetic expressions involving numbers, you can have a constraint solver reason about whether certain expressions are equal to other ones. And that gives you a lot of flexibility. Right, so let me show you a little bit of an example of, of, of what you can do in Haskell if you have a, a rich type system. So um, I'm not going to explain these examples in as nearly as much detail as I did before. But so this example, this is just a, a function that comes from a project called Ivory. So Ivory is a domain-specific language for programming, quad, eh, programming quadcopters, you know, things that look like this. And what it's doing is it's embedding a very safe C programming language inside of Haskell, right? So to program a quadcopter, you need to have, it's an embedded system, so you need precise control of memory. So the embedded type system, right, is keeping track of, for example, the, the memory as, you know, this is an array of four eight-bit unsigned integers, right? And so this function, it is making sure that if you, um, get an argument that's one of those, and you're going to produce an unsigned 32-bit integer. All right, and, and again, I didn't write this code, so I can't tell you exactly how it works, but it can, it, the ivory type system embedded in Haskell can ensure that all of these array accesses are safe, and that after you do all of these shifts, you're gonna get that 32-bit integer. Okay, here's another example. So this is an example that comes from a talk by Kenny Foner, who's a PhD student at Penn, and he gave, it, it was part of a talk that he gave at the Compose conference. And so what he was showing at that conference was, he was showing a particular kind of recursive programming in Haskell or in ML, where you can, as you're doing recursion down a list, you can actually do some computation on the way back, some computation on the way down, and some computation on the way up, back up. Sounds familiar, right? So what's going on here? So here we're taking two lists. Actually, these are, in this version, they are length index lists. So they are lists that have exactly n elements in it, right? And we are going to convolve them together. So this isn't zip. Like the type kind of looks like zip, but the second list is going to be in the reverse of the first list. Right? So the first element in the first list is going to be paired with the last element of the second list, and so on. And we're going to do that by, by the help of this helper function, so, which is going to walk down the first list until it gets to the end, and when it gets to the end, it's going to return the result paired with the second list, and as it goes back up again, it's gonna pattern match the second list, pulling out each element in reverse order and pairing that in that reverse, all right? And so this works only when the two lists are the same length. And what Kenny was able to do is he was able to use this pluggable constraint solver to show that we're guaranteed that output list is always, you're always, they're always gonna match up and that output list is gonna be the right length. And that really boils down to figuring out what is this, what's going on on our helper function, right? We start, we start with the first list that has length m, and we're going to be going through, and the, the result, we've done m steps of it when we get it back, and then the second list, we've taken off, we've taken off m steps from the second list as we pull it back up. 
right? And so the con constraint solver is able to kind of verify that all of these conditions, the fact that m has to be less than n, and the fact that this means that this list at the end, at the end has to be empty, because we're going to get um, n minus n is 0 when you get to the end, so you know it's going to be an empty list. It's able to verify all of these things. So this is yet another example of how we can, once you have rich ability to express constraints in your types, you want your type checker to help you satisfy those. Okay, one more example. So this is an example by my student Richard Eisenberg, who has really been pushing on extensions for, for GHC. And um, this code is written in, in sort of the, it's in GHC head, right? It's not, been, it's not been released in GHC yet. But what this code is doing is it's trying to provide a safe interface for working with a database in Haskell, right? And what do you do when you work with a database? Right, you might read in some tables, right? So, that, so, so let's look at the read DB function, right? You might load up some tables, right? Those tables are going to be described by some schema, right? So the schema tells us what the tables are going to be. And then maybe we're going to ask the user, okay, we want to, this is a database of students and classes, and maybe we want to look in all the classes, find a professor in a particular class, find all the students that that professor has and then show all the student information for the students, right? So we find out what professor we want and then we'll, go, we'll create this in the relational algebra, we might create um, an expression that calculates that information that we need, right? Where it's going to pull out from the classes table, it's going to pull out all of the classes with the professor is the one that we're looking for. And maybe it's going to create the joint product of that, that table with the student table. So we're going to get all these records. Think about what type that record is. And then we, out of that, maybe we'll select out of those, those records where the identifier for the student is in the list of all the students of that class. So that will select all of, the, all of the students, and then out of that, we're only interested in the first and last names, and so we'll project out the first and last names and print them out. All right, so notice there's not a lot of types written in this code, right? I've, just, I've described it to you with more types than it actually has, and Haskell can kind of figure out the connections of, you know, what, what has to be true of this schema that we're using to read this table so that this particular manipulation will work? And if we're using the result of this query, what, what, re, what has to be true about that project? We have to have something that, right, if we're going to project out something that we can print all the names, we have to project it so we end up with something that looks like this schema, where we have a first name and then a last name. Right, so just the fact that we're printing out the results, the, the rows that we get from our query, that tells us what the project has to be and kind of back propagates it so that we can work with this database <coughs> safely and dynamically. Again, here, type inference is a really important part because it's um, maybe we're going to change our minds about what the schema is we don't write anything down, Haskell's going to figure out exactly what we do need. Okay, so I've given you, I, in this last example, I've given you a little bit of preview of what's coming up in GHC. And so I want to tell you a little bit more about it. And so this, all of this, the extensions that I'm going to talk about now, they're all part of, this is Richard, all part of Richard's dissertation that he is just finishing up this year. Right, so one thing that kind of um, has been a difficulty in GHC until recently is that we have data type promotion, but it's a trick that only works once, right? You can promote a data type, but it has to be a standard data type. You can't promote an index data type. And what that does is it cuts out a class of dependently typed programs that you can write. You just don't have as much expressiveness in your type language as you would have in a full spectrum language. Right, so what Richard has done is he's, he, he has um, 
figured out how to combine the type and kind language together in Haskell so that the restrictions that we had before just kind of vanished, right? There were restrictions about types based on their kind, but if we kind of blur those distinctions, we don't, we can't even force that. Right, and so he is. So he's added this new flag called type and type, and he's made the type level programming language of Haskell look a lot like Agda, but only in the type language. We still have these distinctions between types and terms, but once you get into types, you're a lot closer to what Agda allows. And he is. We've we've worked to get out the theory, and then he has implemented in GHC and. They're on release candidate two, so it's going to, GHC eight is going to be out very soon with this. At the same time, Richard has also been working on, and you, you actually saw this a little bit in this example, which is the fact that in Haskell, you could, every type application must be inferred. There's no way of saying, I know exactly what type I want to instantiate this polymorphic function with, and I want you to use this type. And this becomes really much more important when you start doing, when you're programming with your types. So for example, um, here, these are explicit type applications in this example, right? Um, the type is actually the field of the database schema that we want to, that we're interested in. And we need to somehow be able to tell our function that works over any field which specific field that we want. So that's a, that's a type level symbol, and then we're explicitly providing it with the at sign to the field function. Right? So it's a way of providing explicit type arguments. Right? So Richard has also um, figured out with me how to integrate that with the Henley-Milner type system, which wants to infer everything. And um, he's also implementing that, and so that is also available in the release. And then the last bit, and this is, this is something that's still in progress. This is not coming in GHC8. Um, you saw the singleton type in the example. We needed to have a singleton color. And then we were using that to get, uh, to get actual dependency going on. Um, that's a trick that works, but if you use it a lot, you get a lot of boilerplate. And Richard is really thinking about how we can have a real pi type. We know what it should do because we know how the singletons work. We just need to describe a new feature, a new pi type that can capture that idiom so that you don't have to go through and create all your singletons and work with them. Right? So he is he's working out that as the last part of his dissertation as we speak. OK. so. Um, that's that's how where I want to conclude. So there's great things, lots of fun happening in GHC. That you can do a lot of stuff, um, and even more. So it's really exciting to to both try to make this stuff happen, but also to see all of all of the applications that we can get from dependent types. Okay, thank you. So one thing that I hear a lot of people say when they talk about dependent types is it's great uh, once everything compiles, but they seem, uh, at least once you've proved something, they seem to sort of break apart in the context of refactoring. And so I've heard like one big issue is you're going to refactor your code and your proof breaks apart and you have to reprove it, which is a semi-tedious process right now. I was wondering what your thoughts on that in terms of preserving proofs in the context of refactoring and everyday programming? Yeah, so that's a really good question, right? So you do a lot of work to make something all hang together, and then you want to make some changes, and you want to propagate those changes consistently. And it's really nice to have a type system when you are making changes, because they tell you where, where all the parts of your code you need to change. Right? And it would be really great if we could use those type errors to automatically do those changes for us. I mean, not even if it's just. Dependent types kind of make that more available because we have more information in the type errors of what, what kind of change they make. Um, so I think this is a really good opportunity for research and program synthesis. Right? So there's been a lot of people working on, let's look at how to automatically write programs based on some test cases or based on some types. Right? Dependent types is a really good way of specifying programs. And if you can do a little bit of search, you can save a lot of effort. Right, so I think this is a, a place where program synthesis could, has a real opportunity to make an impact. So for someone that's still like trying to learn dependent types, would it be better to 
try Haskell right now, or would it be better to get a language like Idris to get started? <laughs> um, that's a really good question, too. Um, I think there's a little bit more tutorial material out there for Idris and for Agda. So just kind of sh seeing a lot of examples of how that works. This is still fairly new in Haskell. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that Haskell programming with dependent types is Haskell programming. And so you just, uh, you will start to see more and more of just this is how you program in Haskell. And you will be learning how to program with dependent types as a part of that process. At least that's what I hope will happen. <laughs> So uh, you made the point that in an Agda program, uh, all the type information is available at runtime yeah. um, because there's no distinction. Whereas in Haskell, usually it's erased and then you sort of have to reify it manually kind of when you want it yeah. to be yeah. available. Uh -huh. um, but in some contexts, the erasure is a big bonus, right, in terms of carrying around less information or things like that. Do you think there's sort of a distinction in, say, like the Haskell world between the kind of dependent type programming where you don't need to reify this stuff at runtime versus where you do? Or do you kind of consider it all to be the same thing and it's maybe not interesting distinction to make? I think it's a really important distinction to make, right? I mean, it has huge impact on performance of how much information you're carrying around at runtime. And I think this is this is really the key of what Richard is doing here, right? Is when he's adding this pi type, right? It's a different type. It's not going to be the same as the arrow type and it's not going to be the same as a for all quantifier. Right? So it's going to, like Agda, you don't have to create all these singletons in the boilerplate, but it's going to be the indication that you're going to have something that's around at runtime and that can also be dependent. And that's, that's I think, the key, is just to have enough types to kind of express the difference between a dependency where there, things are erased and dependency where things are still around. And, there, and I should say that there are some extensions to Agda that people are working on to allow you to have that kind of erasure in Agda. There's a lot of optimization that goes along in Idris to kind of figure out where you don't need those indices. So the story is not at all clear. OK, so I have another question. Um, <clears throat> so you showed the insert function from red black trees. Yeah. Um, and um, many people don't show the delete function because it's actually really complicated. Um, <laughs> So this is very well known. Um, yeah. So my question would be, can you can you give a ballpark estimate of how long it would be in Haskell if you would write it in that style as you've written the insert function? Yeah, so the deletion function is in the repo. I just couldn't fit it in the talk. Um, <laughs> so you can take a look at it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually based on, so if you have seen my, my he has a blog post about how to do deletion on red black trees, where he does a little bit differently than a standard deletion algorithm, but it's a little bit easier to reason about. And so had a fun time with Matt Might and a couple other people sitting around trying to figure out how we could do this in Haskell. And it's, it is longer than insertion. That's why it's not in the talk, but it's, it's completely doable. Is that the blog post with the double blacks? Yeah, it's the blog post with the double blacks. And you have to keep track of the double blacks. Um, yeah, you have, you have the extended colors, too. This is actually a question for everybody in the room. Um, <laughs> can I have a show of hands for how many people think that it would be possible to uh, translate the Agda red black tree uh, into Scala? Cool. Shall we have an unconference session tomorrow where we try and do it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You had mentioned that there are certain problems that you could program in Idris or Agda, but not dependently typed Haskell. Could you give an example of that? Oh, uh, you mean without this uh, type and type extension? Uh, I guess I misunderstood. I, I thought you yeah. had stated that. Uh, um, certainly without type and type, which is a very recent extension, there are plenty of things you, you cannot express, right? Because. Um, well, because you want to have, you need to express that extra dependency, or you have, you want to index things by kinds instead of types. That just was not available, right? Now there are fewer things. It's hard to say that you can do everything because I haven't done everything, but I think we are a lot closer than we used to be.